그럼 이어서 제 3차 페알락 비즈니스 포럼 두 번째 세션을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 참석자 여러분들은 모두 자리에 착석해 주시기 바랍니다. 두 번째 세션은 온라인 비즈니스 페알락 진출에 대해 동아시아와 중남미에서 오신 연사분들의 발표가 있겠습니다. 이번 세션은 외교부 중남미국 김건화 낭미 과장님께서 진행을 맡아주시겠습니다. 저장님과 발표자분들은 무대 위로 올라와 주시기 바랍니다. 안녕하십니까. 그두 번째 세션을 맡게 된 김건화 과장입니다. 그 어제 이틀 동안 저희가 한 행사는 그 4차 산업혁명과 그 한국과 중남미의 그 협력 방안을 논의하는 자리였습니다. 오늘은 두 가지 점에서 차이가 있습니다. 어제는, 어제까지는 이론과 정책에 대해서 얘기했고요. 오늘은 그런 이론과 정책을 바탕으로 실제적인 문제, 이 비즈니스에 대한 문제로 이렇게 조금 더 현실적인 그 테마를 다루게 됐습니다. 그리고 두 번째는 어제까지는 한국과 중남미였는데 이제 한국이 포함된 동아시아와 중남미에 대한 그 지역적인 확장 차원에서 4차 산업혁명을 이해하는 그런 자리입니다. 시작하기 전에 한, 한 가지 뭐, 음, 그 양념 비슷한 말씀 드리겠습니다. 혹시 그 비즈니스라는 말의 어원을 아시는지 모르겠습니다. 이 비즈니스는 말 그대로 비지에서 나왔습니다. 바쁘다에서 나온 겁니다. 그 오늘 여기 계신 비즈니스 하시는 분들 다 바쁘시죠? 근데 어제까지 공무원이 하셨다고 해가지고 공무원분들이 바쁘지 않았다는 의미는 아닙니다. 여기 있는 계신 분들은 여러모로 바쁜 분들인데 비즈니스를 하시니까요. 근데 안 바쁜 것처럼 보일 수도 있습니다. 그리고 어떤 분은 아주 바쁜 분처럼 보일 수도 있고요. 근데 실제는 제가 생각하기엔 머리가 바쁜 분들입니다. 여러 가지 그 비즈니스나 세상을 바꾸는 방법에 대해서 항상 생각하는 분들이기 때문에 이분들 머리에 차 있는 것 중에 하나가 효율성이라고 생각합니다. 제가 이 시작하기에 앞서서 그 발표하는 분들이 그래서 가능한 그 우리 비즈니스맨들의 그 역량을 보여주시기 바라면서 짧고 아주 핵심적인 내용으로 중심으로 발표해 주시고요. 그 다음에 질문을 통해서 그 보완하는 그런 형식이 됐으면 좋겠습니다. 그럼 먼저 어 우리 한국무역협회 이비즈니스 지원 본부장이신 조한희 부장, 본부장님 어, 먼저 발표하시겠습니다. 네. 그 여러분들 함께 같이 저희 무역협회에 대해서 소개를 드리고 또 저희 무역협회가 운영하고 있는 두 가지 그 e-business 서비스인 tradecorea.com과 k m o l 2 4를 소개할 수 있게 돼서 기쁘게 생각합니다. 제 발표 순서입니다. 아마 어, 여기 계신 한국 분들은 대부분 키타에 대해서 알고 계시겠습니다만, 어, 또 외계 소신 분들을 위해서 간략히 키타에 대해서 설명을 드리고 제가 어, 말씀드리고자 하는 메인 타픽인 TradeCorea.com과 k m o l 2 4에 대해서 소개를 드리고 또 저희 키타가 하고 있는 글로벌 마케팅 그 노력을 어, 간단히 소개드리면서 마지막 어, 결론을 말씀드리고 오늘 발표를 마치도록 하겠습니다. 먼저 우리 무역협회입니다. 어, 굉장히 오래된 역사를 가지고 있습니다. 1946년에 설립됐고요. 어, 우리 한국 정부가 1948년에 설립이 됐습니다. 정부 수립보다 2년 먼저 또 한국 전쟁인 1950년보다 5년 전에 이렇게 일찍이 설립이 돼서 71년의 역사를 가지고 있습니다. 보통 그 여러분들이 그 트레이드 어소시에이션 하면 많은 그 어, 나라에서 비슷한 단체를 가, 어, 보셨을 겁니다. 그러나 그 키타는 좀 독특합니다. 저희 그 어, 직원 수라든가 또는 저희가 가지고 있는 리소스라든가 또는 하고 있는 일또 국내외 네트워크 이런 분에서 많은 그 차이가 있습니다. 저희는 그 10개의 그 어, 해외 브랜치 오피스를 가지고 있습니다. 또 13개의 로컬 브랜치 오피스를 가지고 있습니다. 어, 뭐 하고 있는 데 굉장히 다양합니다. 저희 직원 한 350명 정도 되고요. 그 트레이드 정책 건이라든가 연구, 또 글로벌 바이어셀러 매칭 서비스, 또 어, 무역 정보 데이터베이스라고 하는 키타넷 또는 트레이드 나비를 운영하고 있고요. 또 각종 그 민간 통상 외교를 함께 하고 있습니다. 
물론 제가 맡고 있는 어, 온라인 오프라인 어, 트레이딩 파 스트럭처를 이렇게 운영하기도 있고요. 그래서 다른 그 일반 트레이더 어스처에서하고 좀 다른 그런 면이 있습니다. 이것은 저희 어, 범위를 좀 좁혀서 우리 무역협회가 어, 온라인 비즈니스에서 어, 어떻게 발전해 왔나를 보여주고 있습니다. 1988년 당시 그 인터넷이 아직 나오지 않은 시대에 어, 별도의 그 어, 통신망을 통해서 코티스라는 무역정보 데이터베이스를 운영하고 있습니다. 또 빨간 그 점선으로 표시된 어, 주목해 주십시오. 2008년에 저희가 트레이드코리아닷컴을 런칭을 해서 약간 10년의 역사를 가지고 있고요. 어, 2014년 케이몰 24를 이두 가지를 제가 오늘 말씀을 드릴 건데요. 24를 어, 런칭해서 약 3년의 역사를 가지고 있습니다. 네, 먼저 오늘 메인 타픽 중에 하나인 트레이드코리아닷컴에 대해서 어, 소개해 드리겠습니다. 트레이드코리아닷컴은 기본적으로 이마켓플레이스입니다. 네, 여러분들이 아마 많은 그 이마켓플레이스를 이렇게 어, 경험하시고 보아왔을 텐데요. 저희가 그 여기에 보유된 그 회원 등록수라든가 또는 그 하고 있는 역할 면에서는 좀 어, 다른 것과는 좀 차별화된 그런 면이 있습니다. 저희 그 트레이드코리아닷컴은 등록 회원 수가 약 26만 명 26만 개 국내 업체들이 이렇게 등록돼 있습니다. 어, 국내 한국 업체들이 약 어, 10만 개, 또 해외 업체들이 약 16만 개 이렇게 등록이 돼 있고요. 상품 등록 수만 해도 약 66만 개가 이렇게 등록이 돼 있고요. 그 연간 그, 어, 그 페이지 저 비지터 수가 약한 800만 정도 이렇게 됩니다. 그리고 한 5만 7천여 건의 거래 알선 제의가 들어와서 이루어지고 있는 한국의 대표적인 이마켓플레이스입니다. 오른쪽에 보시면 저희 그 어, 트레이드코리아닷컴의 메인 페이지입니다. 여러 가지 그 상품 카테고리별로 어, 등록자들이 자신의 상품을 등록해서 또 어, 어, 그 국내 그 업체들에게 이렇게 소개하고 어, 판매가 이루어지는 그런 이마켓플레이스입니다. 트레이드코리아닷컴의 어떤 특징적인 것은 어, 단순히 그 온라인 그 마켓플레이스만 가지고는 제대로 작동이 잘 안됩니다. 그래서 저희가 어, 온오프가 겸해서 옴니채널 마케팅을 이렇게 하고 있습니다. 그래서 실제 그 트레이드쇼가 있으면 그 트레이드쇼를 온라인을 통해서 이렇게 버추얼 트레이드쇼를 어, 엽니다. 그래서 어, 참여해서 사전에 어, 자, 자신들의 어떤 최적의 파트너를 찾을 수 있도록 그렇게 하고 있습니다. 특히 이제 어, 저희가 그 GBMS라는 글로벌 어, 비즈니스 매칭 서비스를 어, 하고 있는 것이 다른 그 어, B2B 마켓플레이스와의 어떤 차별화된 점입니다. 이것은 등록할 필요도 없고 가입할 필요도 없습니다. 별도의 자신의 정보만 간단히 입력하면 저희가 별도로 약 20명의 아주 그 경험이 많은 그 비즈니스 매칭 메이커가 있습니다. 카테고리별로 화장품이라든가 전자제품 또 케미컬 원재료라든가 또는 뭐 푸드나 메디컬 또 자동차 부품이나 이런 쪽으로 약 20명의 전담 요원이 어, 매칭을 담당하고 있습니다. 그래서 최적의 파트너를 이렇게 찾아주는 오프라인도 병용된 그런 그 형태의 어, 이마켓플레스입니다. 그래서 연간 저희가 어, 약한 2만 5천 건의 비즈니스 매칭을 어, 성과를 이렇게 내고 있습니다. 그 어, 저희 아까 말씀드린 20명의 전담 음, 음, 비즈니스 매치메이커가 우리 무역협회가 보유한 150만 개의 그 바이어 DB 또 10만 개의 세일러 DB 중에서 어, 그 요청에 따라서 최적의 파트너를 발굴해서 이렇게 제공하는 그런 서비스입니다. 다음은 그 B2C 형태의 온라인 쇼핑몰인 K몰 24에 대해서 말씀드리도록 하겠습니다. 아마 여러분들 엄청이 많은 그 온라인 쇼핑몰을 봤을 겁니다. 저희 그 K몰 24는 그 우리 한국의 중소기업만을 위해서 전문화된 수출 익스포드 오리엔티드인 온라인 쇼핑몰입니다. 어, 주로 이제 중소기업들 위주로 이렇게 운영이 되고 있고요. 어, 저희가 그 영문 및 중문몰이 있고 또그 글로벌 그 온라인 쇼핑몰인 티몰 글로벌, 이베이, 아마존 이런 등과 또 협력해서 그런 그 쇼핑몰에도 저희 K몰이 같이 협력해서 그쪽 그 소비자들이 직접 
음, 케이몰을 통하지 않고 그 자신들이 접속하기 편한 쇼핑몰을 통해서 한국 상품을 구매할 수 있도록 이렇게 하고 있습니다. 어, 케이몰에 일단 등록이 되면 저희가 그잘 어, 알려진 중국의 그 웨이브라든가 페이스북 또 인스타그램 통해서 이메일 마케팅을 합니다. 그리고 또 경우에 따라서는 어, 케이팝 그 커뮤니티 또 파워 블로그 이런 사람들과 협력해서 어, 어, 마케팅을 합니다. 특히 이제 소위 그 PPL이라고 해서 프로덕트 플레이스먼트라고 해서 어, 유명한 K-드라마나 이런 쪽에 저희 상품을 이렇게 어, K, 어, PPL 형태로 이렇게 넣기도 하고요. 또 K-팝 그 유명한 그 어, K-팝 싱어들하고도 같이 제품 홍보를 위해서 협력을 합니다. 어, 지금까지 저희 무역회가 운영하는 B2B 이, 어, 플랫폼인 TradeKorea.com과 KMOL24를 이렇게 어, 설명을 드렸고요. 기타 이제 저희 무역협회가 또 하고 있는 온오프라인 글로벌 마케팅 협력 사례를 몇 가지 그, 어, 화면, 어, 화면 캡처라든가 사진으로 소개를 드릴까 합니다. 어, 저희가 그, 이, 그 온라인 비즈니스의 글로벌 플레이어들과 수시로 어, MOU라든가 어, 기타 그 협력 사업을 하고 있습니다. 그래서 이거는 이제 2008년 어, 대표적인 그 어, 온라인 기업인 알리바바하고 이제 MOU를 체결해서 현대까지 여러 가지 그 협력 사업을 해오고 있습니다. 그래서 왼쪽은 저희가 이제 어, MOU를 만든 사진이고요, 오른쪽은 어, 비즈니스 매칭 행사를 매년 이렇게 하고 있는 그런 사진입니다. 어, 특히 이제 어, 온라인 상의 어떤 그 어, 프로모션을 알리바바닷컴하고 같이 이렇게 하고 있습니다. 또 아까도 잠깐 말씀드렸습니다만, 그 알리바바 그룹이 운영하는 그 B2C 쇼핑몰인 티몰의 코리안 파빌리언을 별, 저희가 별도로 그렇게 어, 이렇게 입점을 시켜서 한국 기업들이 어, 직접 티몰에 이렇게 들어가려면 여러 가지 수수료라든가 또는 절차 이런 것이 복잡합니다. 그래서 그냥 케이몰만 등록이 돼도 어, 이걸 통해서 티몰에서 상품을 팔수 있도록 중국 소비자들이 티몰에서 어, 직접 어, 할수 있도록 이렇게 협력 관계가 이루어져 있습니다. 뭐 티, 어, 티몰 내에 있는 그 케이몰의 사진 캡처입니다. 또 어, 경우에 따라서는 그 여러 가지 그 행사를 같이 하고 있는데요. 작년 같은 경우 한국 우수 상품 디자인 및 어, 타오바오 진출 상담회를 어, 성황리에 이렇게 한 적이 있습니다. 어, 또한 가지 이제 여러 가지 저희가 알리바바 같은 사업을 하고 있는데요. 그 알리 알리바바의 지급 결제 시스템인 알리페이가 그 코엑스 내에 저희가 아마 저희 그 무역협회에 위치한 그 코엑스에 모레 알리페이 센터라고 알리페이 고객들을 대상으로 하라는 서비스 센터를 작년에 오픈을 하는 도록 저희가 이제 협력을 했습니다. 아직 그 활발히 어, 운영되지는 않고요. 특히 이제 한중간의 그 사드 분쟁으로 중국 관광객이 줄어들어서 조금 그 아직 활성화는 덜 됐습니다. 저희가 더 이렇게 만에 활성화하도록 이렇게 할 예정입니다. 어, 지금까지 이제 중국 알리바와 협력인데요. 기타 어, 아시아의 다른 국가들과도 수시로 온라인 그 협력 관계를 유지하고 있습니다. 이 그리, 이 사진은 저희가 음, 태국 상무부와 어, 2015년 그 MOU를 체결해서 온 오프라인 그 비즈니스 협력을 하고 있는 그런 음, 사진입니다. 매년 어, 5월에 태국에서 그 식품 박람회가 열립니다. 그 식품 박람회에 참가해서 사전 그 온라인 버추얼 전시회를 저희가 함께 개최하고 또 실제 어, 전시회가 열릴 때 태국 가서 어, 어, 지 협력 사업을 하고 있습니다. 태국뿐만이 아니 어, 이건 이제 음, 그 마찬가지 그 온라인 공동 전시관을 또 상시적으로 어, 운영을 하고 있습니다. 
태국뿐만 아니라 이제 베트남도 저희가 어, 비슷한 사업을 하고 있고요. 베트남의 그 경제 기획부 투자 기획 및 투자부하고 어, 이렇게 협력 사업을 하고 있습니다. 맨그 사업은 뭐 비슷합니다. 베트남 어, 상품 또 한국 상품을 서로 이렇게 소개하는 그러한 그 어, 사업을 하고 있습니다. 말레이시아와도 어, 함께 하고 있습니다. 말레이시아의 어, 무역 진흥 기관인 마트레이드와 2002년 그 MOU를 체결해서 여러 차례 그 CEO 레벨의 에, 미팅과 또 워크숍도 같이 하고 또 온라인 협력 사업을 온라인 트레이드 쇼를 함께 이렇게 하고 있습니다. 지금까지 이제 아시아권의 기업이나 기관들하고 이렇게 어, 협력하는 걸 보여드렸는데요. 어, 아시아를 넘어서 중남미 IDB 그 미주 개발 은행과도 저희가 MOU를 맺고 어, 수시로 이렇게 협력을 하고 있습니다. 온라인 트레이드 쇼와 또 어, 현지 그 온라인 음, 에, 즉석 채팅을 통해서. 어, 비즈니스 파트너를 찾아주는 그런 이벤트를 어, 종종 하고 있습니다. 이상 음, B2B와 B2C에 대해서 설명을 드렸고요. 간략히 이제 마지막 말씀을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 아까 전 세션에서도 말씀을 드렸습니다만 다른 연사들께서 그 우리 아시아, 어, 동아시아와 라틴 아메리카의 그 어, 협력 여지는 굉장히 많다고 봅니다. 특히 이제 어, 그 이커머스의 어떤 어, 영향력이 굉장히 확대가 되고 있는데 어, 이를 통해서 그 교역을 넓힐 그 여지가 많다고 봅니다. 그러기 위해서는 가장 중요한 게 저는 그 어, 영세 기업들 마이크로라든가 스몰 미디엄 사이즈 그 중소 기업들의 그 교역 참여가 상당히 중요하고 하다고 봅니다. 그런데 이 중소기업들의 어떤 교역 참여는 여러 가지 그 진입 장벽이 있게 마련입니다. 아, 이를테면 저 인력이라든가 또는 자금 이런 문제가 있고 그래서 어, 이런 것을 그래도 그런 그 어려움 속에서도 어, 교역에 참여할 수 있는 대안이 바로 이커머스라고 봅니다. 아, 그래서 어, 오늘 여기에 이제 어, 그 필락 회원국들의 정부에서 오신 분들도 많은데요. 어, 이런 분야에 그 협조 노력이 좀더 있어야 되겠다. 저희가 실제 어, B2C 모를 이렇게 운영하다 보니까 이제 여러 가지 그 어, 국가 간의 정책의 조화가 이루어지지 않아서 생기는 문제들이 많습니다. 대표적인 게 이제 통관 문제고요. 그래서 그러한 쪽에 어, 노력을 좀 많이 해주셨으면. 좋겠다 이런 말씀을 드리고요. 그런 분야는 굉장히 그 많다고 봅니다. 아 그리고 마지막으로 어 저희 무역협회는 아 앞서 보셨지만 여러 그 이커머스 어 e 또 온라인 비즈니스 글로벌 플레이어들과 항상 협력하고 또 앞으로도 여러 가지 그그 그 사업을 공유할 그런 의지가 있고 준비가 돼 있습니다. 아 어, 기회가 된다면 어 그런. 음 어, 파트너로서 한번 했으면 좋겠습니다. 이상 발표 마치겠습니다. 고맙습니다. 예, 조 본부장님 감사드립니다. 다음은 그 멕시코 전자 상거래 회장 진짜 지금은 그 제교 벤처스라는 회사를 운영하시는 그 멕시코의 에릭 페레스 그로바스 그 멕시코 전자 상거래 회장님께서 그 멕시코 디지털 경제의 기회와 허들, 장애에 대해서 말씀해 주시겠습니다. 박수로 환영해 주시죠. 감사합니다. 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 One is the Mexican Association of Online Sales, of which I am president, and the other is Jaguar Ventures, a venture capital fund that I uh, co-founded, and I manage the Mexican operations. So what is the Mexican Association of Online Sales? AMBO is an association that was formed in Mexico by the main business digital leaders operating the country, both Mexican and foreign, with the purpose of helping promote the digital economy. And we do it in two different fronts. 
On one side, we try to uh, do lobbying to, to, to have best policies that can promote and enable e-commerce in Mexico, that can enable the digital economy in Mexico. And on the other hand, we have what it is already the most relevant e-commerce event in the country, which is Hot Sale, that has the purpose of bringing people into the digital economy. I, I will tell you more about it later on. My second point of view comes from my, my daily job, which is uh, managing Jaguar Ventures in Mexico. We are a venture capital fund that has identified that mainly thanks to mobile broadband, Mexicans and the rest of Latin America are going to be able to get services and products that previously they were not able to do so. And I want to start by telling you about one example that I think speaks about the potential of the Mexican digital economy. Not many people know this, but at least last year, Mexico City was the most relevant city for Uber worldwide in terms of, of travels generated. And this includes the US, and this includes all the countries where Uber operate. Why is that? Why has Mexico City been able to be the most relevant market in terms of travels for Uber? The reason is that in Mexico, we already have a sizable digital population. We, have, we are the fifth largest country with Facebook users. We are the eighth largest country in internet users. We are the fourth country in time spent on social media. And not only we are already large, but we keep growing. Last year, we were the third country with internet users growth. And this is a very interesting data point, and I think is that Mexico City is the second largest city in the world with active Facebook users. What about e-commerce? Even though in AMBO we are interested in the whole of the digital economy, we know that the key part of it is e-commerce. It's only a part of it. You cannot say Uber is e-commerce. There are many things in the digital economy. But e-commerce is the most relevant industry that we need to push. So in the case of Mexico, fortunately, e-commerce has been growing at a very nice pace, 45% per year for the last seven years. That being said, it is still small relatively to the size of the Mexican economy. It represents less than 1% of the economy. Last year, we estimate that it represented 17 billion US dollars. It's a nice size, but it's still very small with regard of the size of the Mexican economy. Why is this? Why is, on one hand, as I mentioned you, we already have a lot of internet users, however, they still are not buying a lot through uh, online. The main reason is the low penetration of financial services. Unfortunately, in Mexico, less than 40% of adults have a financial account. And that obviously means that we also have few credit cards. We have less than 20 million credit cards. That is less than 15% of the total population. If you do not have a efficient digital payment system, it's difficult to develop a digital economy. And that, and if you see in our portfolio, you will not be surprised that we are heavily invested on financial tech. Because what it's an area of opportunity, it's also a great potential of investment particularly because through mobile, many Mexicans are gonna be able to become part of the, of the, of the financial world. Uh, to mention the examples in which we have already invested, Connecta, Connecta is a digital payment platform that just last year got an investment from one of the largest companies in Mexico called FEMSA, $6 million. Confio, Confio is a digital platform that it's enabled loans for small and medium companies that are not being served by banks in Mexico. Uh, we, we are very happy that it has already attracted the interest of one of the most relevant fintech investors in the world, which is QED. Nexu, Nexu is a marketplace that is helping Mexicans be able to obtain a credit to acquire a car. And then we have Solvers, which is a 
a marketplace of, uh, uh, of services, of, of home services, that through its platform, it's also helping uh, these people to start having financial services. But I have to admit, we are not the only ones that have realized this potential. Just last year, this uh, are two examples of transactions that took place in Mexico. Uh, as you will know, BBVA is one of the largest banks in the world, and it acquired a digital payment platform called OpenPay. And you also have General Atlantic, one of the largest financial investment institutions in the world, that last year invested in Clip, that it's a, uh, an electronic point of sale service for small and medium companies. So as you can see, I would like to say that Jaguar is the only one that have realized this, but we are not the only ones. There's a huge opportunity and large players have already realized that. What is the other reason why e-commerce is still less than 1% of the Mexican economy? And to be honest, it's, it's ignorance, it's fear of, of people buying online. I'm sure that if I ask you, I have made this question in many countries, and this is not only particular of Mexico. I know I've, I've asked people in Vietnam, I've asked people in Turkey, I've asked people in China, and everywhere I've been told that people is afraid to buy online. So, so this is not a particular problem of Mexicans, but it is a problem. So what are we doing as an association to help people decide to, to buy online? We have this event that is Hot Sale, and it's an event that we do once a year in which all the e-commerce players operating in Mexico sell their products and services with extraordinary discounts. And the idea of this is that even though e-commerce has a lot of benefits, the most tangible benefit for consumers is being able to compare prices and buy products at the lowest prices. And we are happy, that this event has only been running for four years, but we are very happy with the evolution of it, which you can see already follows the typical hockey stick. In 2014, when we started, we sold 375 million pesos, and we were very, very happy. Well, just this year, we sold four million 800 million pesos, so now we are even more excited. But what excites us more about this event is the number of new buyers that we have been able to brought into the digital economy. Just in this year event, we were able to bring into the digital economy almost three new million buyers. If you combine all the buyers that the event has been able to bring into the digital economy in the last uh, five years, it's almost, it's more than five million buyers. So, so we're very proud and happy about this event. What type of companies participate? We have more than 260 companies participating. These are just a, a sample of the companies that I choose to show you because all of them are prominent e-commerce uh, companies that I believe most of you will know. But obviously, besides this, we have a lot of Mexican e-commerce sites, and nothing will make me more happy than if next year we can put in this slide companies from Asia. I, more than one of the companies that I'm showing here actually bring their products from outside of Mexico. eBay and Amazon has a strong cross-border operation. And there are already some Asian uh, companies selling to Mexicans. Uh, Alibaba is one of them. So if you are interested in selling to the Mexican market, I would be very, very happy to talk with you in private about this. Something that, it's, that I think it's very important is that more than half of the visits to this event came from a mobile device. And when you speak with the retailers that sell in the event, mo several will tell you that most of their sales were done through a mobile platform. To give you an idea, mobile commerce grew 64% in Mexico just last year. So if you have an e-commerce mobile platform that you think can work in Mexico, we will be more than happy to help you uh, operate. To, to finish and, and, and be efficient of, of our time, uh, in a nutshell, so we have in Mexico a large, an already large and growing internet population. The, the market is there. 
we have a small e-commerce market relatively to the, to the size of the economy, 17 billion. But if you see the players that are already operating with Amazon, eBay, these are companies that are already investing in Mexico. They already have offices there. You can guess they have great ambitions about our market. And that could be also your case. There's also a very relevant opportunity in financial technology. If you have companies that can help Mexicans become part of, 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 of to, to be able to be uh, part of, of, of the finance world, we will be more than happy to talk with you and, and bring you to Mexico. N nothing will make me more happy to be able to see cacao payment in Mexico. That would be amazing. And last, and I think this is, this is something good to consider, just Mexico City by itself is a 20 million market. And I think that makes things very easier to operate a digital uh, business in Mexico. I think in the case of Uber, just being able to have such a big market in Mexico City facilitates things to then operate in the rest of the country. There are not many countries that have more than 20 million uh, population that most of them are already online. So to conclude, if you're interested in coming to Mexico to be part of our digital economy, I will be more than happy to talk about it. Thank you. 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 중국 소비자를 소비자에게 접근하는 가장 좋은 전략에 대해서 발표하시겠습니다. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to introduce um, uh, a new leader in the cross-border e-commerce and which we believe will be a very efficient and effective way to uh, for those uh, partners in the region to reach the huge Chinese uh, customers. Well, first of all, I would like to talk about, actually, previously, we always think China is the global manufacturing uh, center or workshop. But nowadays, it seems that things are changing. Um, people are talking about economic growth um, um, uh, flattered or uh, it's not as good as uh, a couple of years ago, but at the same time, you can, you can see that um, the structure change is happening. Now the Chinese economy is more driven uh, by the consumption rather than the export. At the same time, the middle class is growing, although the um, uh, rural uh, population is still relatively high, but urbanization is going on there very fast. And according to some figures, about 40% of them are the middle class. So perhaps China is having the largest middle class in the world nowadays. If I use a couple of um, key words to summarize the China economy, well, uh, let me um, uh, use uh, McKenzie's um, uh, report. Uh, it uh, uh, summarized uh, five key points, uh, key words. Of course, uh, consumption and the digital are relevant to us. When we are talking about e-commerce, um, well, we are talking about uh, infrastructures for that. Uh, so as far as I know, if I want to summarize some um, key infrastructures there, well, uh, smartphone market is important, and also another important element is that uh, the users who use the smartphone to search on or to uh, surf on the internet, it's also important. Uh, one interesting thing is that um, the China is very advanced in the delivery, the uh, delivery system. Uh, well, for example, last year, the global delivery parcels um, uh, are around 70 billion, and China alone is about 31.3 billion. So there's about uh, uh, over 2 million 
uh, people are working on the delivery. So because of all those in, uh, elements, China has already become the largest uh, uh, online market or B2C market in the world. And um, uh, although the, the uh, retail business is growing, we can see that uh, the e-commerce is growing in uh, faster space. And um, um, of course, the trade is going on, but when we are talking about cross-border e-commerce trade, it's, um, uh, it, it, has, it enjoys uh, uh, much more uh, speedy growth. Uh, if we look at the penetration of those uh, categories in the e-commerce, we, well, there's a, a graphic there. Um, there's a very high penetration both in uh, sales value and in uh, online shoppers' adoption of these categories. It's very interesting. Um, well, I want to give you a couple of examples of uniqueness of China market. Um, well, it, it tells about how the ladies or women make the purchasing decision journeys in the Chinese families. They play different roles, um, sometimes as the uh, housewife, sometimes as for their daughters, and sometimes uh, as, the mom, as the mom to take care of the babies, and of course, more important, to take care of themselves. So in China, if you can conquer or if you can uh, buy the hearts of the women, then you win the, uh, in the uh, e-commerce. So there's another uniqueness or a trend in China that is um, a solar uh, economy. Well, more and more people uh, live on their own and um, they have uh, different uh, different um, uh, appetite uh, for the consumption, and these elements are worth uh, your attention. So, when we are talking about e-commerce, uh, so what is cross-border e-commerce? Actually, the Chinese government has taken bold initiatives to unilaterally open this kind of cross-border e-commerce or giving the more favorable policy support to cross-border e-commerce. So when we are talking about uh, trading, there's always technical or uh, non-tariff issues that is uh, all your export needs to be compliant with the local technical standards. Um, and uh, well, the Chinese government simply says that, okay, we have the pilot policies for the cross-border e-commerce. You don't need to be local compliant. And um, if you do the uh, cross-border e-commerce, there's always tariff uh, issues. Uh, in China case, if you export uh, via the cross-border e-commerce route, no tariff. Only 70% of the consuming tax and 70% of the, uh, um, the uh, let's say, the VAT. So very favorable. So now the pilot area has been extended to 15 cities or portal cities in China. So how to do the, uh, the cross-border e-commerce? Actually, the platform, the mega internet, internet platform matters. Because these kind of internet platforms can connect the most users with those um, uh, suppliers. Um, and these kind of platforms can provide the extreme user experience to the users. It's not just a, 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 you set up a website and then the consumers can come. Uh, it's not the case because um, in a lot of cases, the consumers come to your platform, they not only want to buy the products, they come here to enjoy the internet services. Some, some of the services are even free. So when we are talking about huge platforms, internet platforms uh, globally, you can see, of course, Facebook is the largest, um, has the largest users. And then if you come to China's um, huge internet platforms, of course, NetEase email services, 
is, is the largest. Of course, WeChat we, um, is uh, by, owned by Tencent. Uh, NetEase Online Dictionary, well, it's ours, and our news portal is also huge. So let me touch briefly on NetEase. Well, it may not be no, well known to, to you all, but NetEase um, is um, uh, famous in, in the internet space in China. It was uh, uh, set up in 1997 and then listed in the US. Uh, and it's nowadays one of the largest, or should be the largest internet company in China with users over 930 million. So that is our financial report, shows our continuous uh, success all the way around. So these are our key uh, apps on the internet. We are the largest email service provider in China with the users over 930 million. You can compare us with the Gmail in the world um, of course, we are the uh, leading uh, online game developer in China with users over 400 million. While we also have the information or news service. And uh, uh, just to mention that on the, on the education side, we are, we are dominant on the online dictionary, free, based on the uh, uh, state of art technology of AR, of the neural uh, science, to do the more than uh, to uh, 20 languages uh, uh, translation with the uh, best uh, voice recognition technology there. Of course, online music, we are the leader in China, and uh, online education, and of course, e-commerce. We are the, in the cross-border e-commerce space, we are the number one in China. Uh, uh, we have the uh, more than 500, uh, 5,000 brands from over 80 hundreds and serving the uh, Chinese uh, uh, consumers, or rather NetEase consumers. Um, uh, of course, uh, based on last year's uh, figure, we accounted 21.6% of the market share, leading our competitors in China. We are also ranked as the number one among the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the genuinity of the products and the satisfaction of the users in China. This is also uh, ranking by Nielsen uh, in, in the relevance of the global brands to the consumers. When you talk about the global brands to Chinese consumers, they will always come to us. Of course, this is also another um, data on this uh, conversion rate, on the uh, exclusive exclusivity of the users and all these um, uh, relevant figures. Then what is the strength of us? Why we have become the leader in that? When we are talking about e-commerce, the first generation of e-commerce based on search technology makes things easier for the consumers to choose what you want. And then come to the second and the third. We, we believe it's the third stage of the e-commerce. So um, basically, in the e-commerce, the key thing is how to shorten the customer purchasing decision journey, make them to buy the things. Of course, um, and the, the search technology helps that. Of course, nowadays, based on the new technologies, you stack up the new ones like uh, big data and, and, and AI to make this kind of search more efficient and more relevant. Well, the second stage, or we call e-commerce 2.0, is based on the content. So you need to uh, interact with your consumers with more information they like. So that's why you see nowadays a lot of uh, um, the um, uh, first generation e-commerce uh, big players, they add up the new business like, uh, well, uh, TV, video, or uh, a lot of many other things, content related things. For us, we, for Natties, we are a media company in essence, so we have these comp this kind of content services to do the ranking promotion, live broadcasting operation, and the scenario lifestyle uh, for those consumers. 
Nowadays, more and more e-commerce happen on the mobile phones. In, China, in our case, 85% buyers buy the things on the, mobile, uh, uh, on the mobile phones. So in the mobile phones, on, in the mobile world, how can you make your, uh, your selling with the immersive apps to create those kind of um, scenario buying uh, situations for the users to attract them to make the discretionary consumption and also aspirational consumption. So it's a challenge thing for the new generation, or we call 3.0 uh, e-commerce. For NetEase, we solve it easily because we have so many immersive apps um, in our ecosystem. For example, emails you may check uh, many times a day, while uh, online dictionary, uh, entertainment, whatever, even uh, online payment. So we have created this kind of immersive apps in the mobile internet world to make this kind of uh, scenario consumption possible. So for NetEase, we provide all around services to our partners. Uh, we set up the, um, the most uh, uh, bonded area uh, warehouses uh, across China in these uh, government um, designated 15 cities across China. Of course, we also set up our uh, offices across the world to be close to our suppliers, to the partners. We provide the uh, uh, all around services uh, from um, uh, settlement, warehouse, logistics, promotion, and everything to make it easier for the global brands to be sold to uh, China on our platform. And uh, of course, we not only help uh, our partners to sell their products, but also help them their branding, corporate branding and uh, uh, products branding in China uh, via our platform. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> I hope I, I said that right. I, as you can see, I have a great uh, translator. Um, you know, when uh, about a month, ago, a month and a half ago, I was asked by the Korean embassy in Caracas to prepare a presentation um, about the fourth industrial revolution in Venezuela. And I was a little puzzled because uh, we were right in the middle of our, th well, we've been in, in the last three months in a continuous uh, state of rioting in Venezuela. And also in the last three years and a half, um, we've been in one of our worst economic crises in history. Um, and it's been following us around. I don't know if you saw, but yesterday, um, a crazy guy came out. It, it, we even came out on the front page of the Wall Street Journal yesterday, right? A crazy guy uh, took a helicopter and basically um, raised in arms. So thinking about having to come and talk here in Korea about the fourth industrial revolution was, did feel like a challenge. So I was thinking, well, how, how can I frame my presentation for this? Well, uh, a month ago, I was um, asked to uh, rise up to a, a big challenge, which is basically chair CONAPRI. CONAPRI is the National Council for the Promotion of Investments in Venezuela. So if you're coming out in, in the front page of the Wall Street Journal with news like this, it's not easy to attract investment uh, to Venezuela. So anyway, 
as you can see, uh, well, I, I accept it. Um, I, love, I love big challenges. I think it's a fun challenge. As you can see, I'm, I'm an optimist by conviction. Um, I don't know if you know the definition of a pessimist. Do you know what a definition? Well, the definition of a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. So anyway, um, that's why I say I'm, I'm a, an optimist by conviction. So anyway, uh, what, I, what I wanted to start talking about before I enter uh, the theme of the fourth industrial revolution in Venezuela is I wanted to begin by talking about the basics. And basically, it has to do with um, what our economy, what the basis or the, what the foundations or the platform, the economic platform that we're standing on in Venezuela at the moment. Because for the last few years, we've been sliding into the third industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution. So the challenge is now, how do we leapfrog into the fourth industrial revolution? So, and, and one of the things uh, I, I was very happy to hear Dr. Kiliparty talk about was um, that investment and public-private collaboration are the keys to prosperity and social and development. So let me, let me begin by giving you a quick glance about our situation, our economic situation in Venezuela. So as you know, our economy is highly dependent on oil. Our GDP has been sliding back and we've been uh, contracting for the last three years and a half. Um, right now, uh, the estimates for 2016, because there are no official figures uh, that have come out, is a, is a shrinking of almost 20% in GDP. It's not, that is not an official uh, number, but it is an estimate. And for 2017, we're, we're expecting between 7 and 8% contraction. Of course, when you take that to, uh, that, that of course has to do with our oil prices, because when you have an economy that is just focused on one source of income, which is oil, that your dependency, of course, depends on volume and, and value. And both have been shrinking. So we've been, we've been dropping in, in production. We've been dropping, of course, the prices since the beginning of 2014 have been uh, or plummeted. And that, of course, has a second uh, effect on trade. So when you talk about trade, of course, exports shrink because 90, almost 99% of your uh, exports depend on oil. Um, and when that happened for many years in a row, uh, what happened was that your industry basically uh, shrunk or almost disappeared. So you're very highly, highly dependent on imports. You're very highly dependent on one product. And of course, that has the effect that you're seeing now, basically scarcity, and uh, uh, basically uh, talent uh, um, exodus and, of course, the different elements that we see in the Venezuelan crisis. Now, what, is, what has been a positive signal in the last few years? And I, I, I do want to focus on this because this is the beginning, possibly the beginning, of uh, positive changes towards a more open economy in Venezuela. In 2015, we started seeing or listening to the president talk about uh, exports. Now, when, when you talk about exports, non-traditional exports, in Venezuela, non-traditional means not oil. That is good, because then, little by little, you start a process of promoting that and making it easier to export. So I just wanted to dwell a little bit on what is blocking investment for Venezuela. Basically, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, in the press, what you read is about the polarization, the political polarization, and of course insecurity. Those are like the very obvious things. But what's underneath that surface is a closed economy. So until we take the economic measures, we will not be able to attract investment. And the other, the other thing that, we, that is very clear to me, or to us in Conapri, is that we won't be able to start agreeing on the rules, the economic rules that we need to attract investment until both sides sit down and start building agreements. So this takes us once again to CONAPRI and to this challenge and the reason I'm very optimistic with CONAPRI. Um, CONAPRI is a, an institution that was founded in 1990. It was, uh, this was maybe 
eight years before President Chavez was elected into power. Um, the mandate back then and today is to provide information and technical support for the promotion and maintenance of investment aimed at strengthening social and productive development. Seems quite basic for attracting investment. Now, as I said before, it was a, a public-private public organization uh, back in the 90s. Uh, since the year 2003 or four or something like that, little by little we started seeing the public members of CONAPRI sliding away or basically um, not appearing at the board meetings. Um, and that is actually a problem because then that discussion is not happening, that discussion of public, private, and basically the practitioners thinking about the future. So our challenge is how do we get the public entities, let's say uh, uh, state-owned companies or public entities to enter the discussion once again with the private sector. And we think that CONAPRI is probably that uh, table where we can attract both sides, both parties, to discuss and to build uh, consensus. So some of the things that we're thinking about have to do with country rebranding, uh, making it very clear what the investment opportunities and what the frameworks around those investment opportunities are. Uh, one of the ideas, we, well, one of the studies that we're beginning to do is uh, on growth diagnostics, basically identifying which are the bottlenecks in the economy that we have to free up so we can start getting investment. And and it all boils down to consensus building between public and private sectors to define what are the, the most important, the priority um, measures that must be taken to, to start attracting investment again. So in short, for the short term, we, uh, the first thing we, we want to do is recruit the public sector companies and institutions back to the board of CONAPRI. We want to build consensus on what the economic measures that must be taken are and how they are implemented. In the middle, in the midterm, basically we're thinking of building an agreement on investment policy between public and private sectors. And for the long term, uh, what, what I would love is to be able to reach some kind of agreement like Colombia did in 1947, where the government and the private sector realized that if they didn't start working together, that was going to harm the country and the economy and, of course, the people. So this is my way of seeing a great opportunity for Korea um, in Venezuela. And it basically has to do with co-writing the new rules of a socially inclusive open economy. Now, I want to say socially inclusive open economy because we've already tried the other two. We tried a a, uh, an open economy which was not socially inclusive, and we had all the problems of the beginning of the 90s. And then recently we tried a socially inclusive but a closed economy, and we have the problem we have at hand at the moment. So h the question is, how may we rewrite the rules to, a, to find or to build a socially inclusive open economy? So if we can actually manage to do this, one of the things that we see is that Venezuela will have a very fast bounce back capacity, basically because we're sitting on the biggest oil tank in the world. Also because we have all the, all the natural resources we can imagine, even wish for, but also talent. We have, all, we have incredible assets in Venezuela. Um, and that takes me to what are the very clear investment opportunities, oil and gas, They've, you know, we haven't been investing all we need to invest, as you see in the, in the production rates uh, of oil. Um, this is a very, very clear opportunity. Uh, mining, of course, uh, we've got basically everything, like from iron ore, bauxite, etc. Telecommunications, we've got the, in, in mobile phones, we've got the highest penetration rates in Latin America. And we've got an extensive uh, telecommunications infrastructure. In agro-industry also, it's basically everything is to be done. And, and tourism, tourism, you'll see at the end, I've got a short video, but you'll see the, the capacity or the potential we have in terms of tourism. Of course, if we manage to tackle the security issue, which I think is also a huge opportunity. I wanted to show also an example of uh, Korean investment in Venezuela. Right now, it's one of the biggest investments there are in Venezuela. It's a, it's a joint venture between PDVSA, Hyundai, and Wilson, uh, a Chinese company. 
uh, where the investment is of $10 million, billion uh, for processing crude oil of up to 210,000 barrels a day uh, from the Orinoco belt. So this takes us finally to the fourth industrial revolution what are the, in Venezuela and what are the opportunities there. The way we see it in Conapri is, first of all, it has to do with e-governance, and it basically has to do with institution um, uh, uh, strengthening. And precisely where Korea has the best e-governance practices is where Venezuela has its breaches and where we, can, we, can, we need a lot of help. And it has to do with government integrated data centers, with customs clearance, electronic systems, online, online patent systems, it's all to be done. Also, smart towns. Uh, Venezuela ha is among the countries with the, in the region with the largest number of mid-sized metropolitan cities, uh, and we're talking about close to 40. Um, and they're all lagging behind in investment and development. And so here, there's a, 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 an opportunity for uh, venturing with, with these cities and private sector, uh, basically to, to start investing in infrastructure. Also in human resources, for the last 20 years, Venezuela has been investing heavily in, in uh, education, in IT and, and technology. Um, it's a shame that a lot of these have left. I was talking to Juan Elias before. He's got a team of Venezuelans down in Chile, but I've heard there are lots of Venezuelans in Panama, in Spain. They're all over the place, even Abu Dhabi. Uh, and so one of the things that I would love is that the day we start having very clear rules on the economic side, we start uh, attracting these Venezuelans that have left. And what I always say is that the best immigration we'll ever have in our history is when those Venezuelans come back to Venezuela. And last but not least, uh, I don't know if you all know, but Venezuela has one of the biggest coltan reserves around the world. Coltan is one of these special metals that is used for all IT purposes. So in conclusion, the way we see it in Conapri is that in the short term, Venezuela has a great balance sheet but a lousy profit and loss statement, um, which is the reason why we think that the bounce back will be quick. In the medium term, uh, we also, at least I, I have the conviction that an agreement will ultimately be reached, um, you know, sooner or later it will be reached, and the first movers will reap the benefits. And I think Korea is positioned to be one of those first movers. Not only a first mover, but also um, there's a lot of affinity, there's a lot of uh, understanding and, uh, and, and I'd say um, affinity between Venezuela and Korea. So to finish, I just wanted to show you a short video on Venezuela.
베네수엘라, 베네수엘라 그 기회 문을 두드리실 분은 앞으로 꼭 볼모 회장님을 찾아뵙기를 바랍니다. 다음은 그 베트남에서 리 마이앙 그 회장님 오셨습니다. 이 성이 안 씨입니다. 어디 본가가 어딘지 모르겠지만 안 씨입니다. 어제 제가 여쭤봤습니다. 안 회장님께 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. 헬로, 땡큐 베리 마스 포 웰컴 유 투데이. 아이 프롬 베트남 앤 Today, I would like to introduce you a little bit about the Vietnamese market uh, and is it potential or not? Uh, I don't know yet, but uh, Korea actually is uh, one of the biggest country invest to Vietnam, own the big company in Samsung, uh, Otea, Shija invest to Vietnam. And I talk with all of those company and they would like to invest to e-commerce in Vietnam, surprisingly. And uh, why is that? Uh, I would like to give you a little bit information about uh, e-commerce uh, in Vietnam and uh, I hope you any company or anybody who in uh, would like to invest to uh, e-commerce in Vietnam can have uh, understand better understand about that uh, a little bit about myself and uh, the company uh, we established uh, 10 years ago we just do e-commerce uh, services around the world uh, we have around 400 people and uh, we have a branch overseas uh, almost all over the world, uh, including the US, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, Australia. Um, what we offer, actually, we offer all kinds of uh, things related to e-commerce, uh, digital marketing, uh, omni-channel solution, and uh, loyalty programs. Uh, so we provide all kinds of services to customers around the world. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, there are two things. Uh, the first one is a macro uh, economy requires for uh, e-commerce booming uh, in Vietnam, if that's the right direction or not. Uh, the second one is the evolution of uh, e-commerce industry finance and uh, reinforced to this uh, optimistic. Uh, and uh, I would like to give you uh, a little bit about uh, what factors, uh, key factor uh, impacted to e-commerce in Vietnam. There are four key factors. The first one is e uh, economy. The second one is uh, internet shopping access geography, uh, distributions about the population in Vietnam, and the last one is the payment methods. Uh, Vietnamese economy uh, in the last five years is a very, very stable. It's around 77% 7 growing rate uh, in the last five years, and uh, estimatedly uh, it's around, uh, keep the same in the next five years. So Vietnam is one of the most promising country, and it's come to GDP evolution at, at the moment and hence a very promising country overall. Uh, in terms of access to online shopping, uh, it's nothing compared with Singapore or Malaysia, but uh, we are uh, one of the strongest uh, internet penetrations uh, in, in, in the Southeast Asia. Um, in terms of uh, number of users, uh, Vietnam have uh, 90 million uh, uh, in population and 50 million uh, internet users in Vietnam and expecting growing uh, to 50% uh, more in the next five years. But uh, in terms of smartphone usage right now, mobile phones uh, is very low uh, comparing with other countries. I don't know why it's happened, but uh, in terms of buying online via mobile phone, is a very limited uh, number using the mobile phones. Geography and populations, uh, Vietnam is uh, least urban uh, of the country. Uh, we don't have uh, we have only two biggest uh, areas. One is the north, uh, Hanoi, and the south is Ho Chi Minh City. In terms of population, uh, 50 million, uh, is, uh, 50 million um, is in, in the Ho Chi Minh City and uh, 10 million in, in Hanoi, which is cover on and, uh, one quarter of the population in Vietnam. And this is uh, impact uh, more in the, uh, the logistics and, uh, and the e-commerce uh, system in Vietnam. And payment methods, uh, Vietnam is a very uh, low uh, credit card users. Uh, I think 95% uh, e-commerce uh, transaction in Vietnam using uh, COD, cash on delivery. And 20% uh, using credit cards uh, only. The, the problem with that is uh, 
the user behavior is that they don't trust us about the online thing uh, right now. So they just uh, more trusted about the look and see in, in the, and what, what they see. Um, so whoever would like to do the e-commerce uh, in Vietnam would see the three uh, structural e-commerce challenges. First one is logistic. It's undeveloped infrastructure right now. The geography uh, diversifies uh, so the north and the south. And uh, payment methods have low credit card penetrations. Uh, the cash and, and delivery is needed, uh, definitely. Uh, retail and economy system uh, is in experience local merchants. Only 16% uh, retail have an uh, online uh, store and uh, the lack of resources uh, to, to do online business. So, uh, thing to consider about uh, doing uh, e commerce in Vietnam, uh, I think it's is at the Right now, uh, Vietnam is a part with uh, all other country in, in Southeast Asia, uh, considers the e-commerce relevant as any paid company uh, uh, country. Uh, so uh, in Vietnam in particular, the number and so, so ultimately changed, not only the, the, the difficult things. Um, Vietnam is a top three emergency internet market in 2015. It's more than 39% 30, uh, of growth. Uh, revenues come from e-commerce market uh, is around two billion in 2016, and uh, expecting is four billion in the uh, next five years. This is very promising for us. Uh, in terms of uh, the segments, uh, electronics and media, uh, footwear and um, clothes, this is a it's a biggest or volumes. Uh, it's uh, almost a billion uh, in 2016, which is uh, for young people. Uh, remember that uh, 70 percent of uh, Vietnamese people are around 30. Uh, this is a very strong uh, buying yeah, in the near future. Uh, the growth across all sectors is uh, almost 50% from uh, 2014 until uh, 2016 uh, in all uh, segments, uh, especially in apparel and footwear and uh, consumer electronics. The ecosystem of e-commerce is being established. Uh, all the services providers are uh, ready uh, right now. All brands from overseas coming, all the retails uh, is ready uh, at the moment. And uh, the growth the number of uh, partners into create a strong e-commerce system. Uh, you know, you can see it's a lot of coming. CJ, Samsung is coming already, and I expect more uh, and more partners coming to uh, to the market. And uh, do you believe in the masses e-commerce in Vietnam? Uh, the, my answer is yes. Uh, and uh, there is very promising uh, country to come in to do e-commerce. So, and uh, thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much, Ahn Hye-jung. Vietnam Smart OSC President. You are the most similar to Vietnam in the most similar to Vietnam. You are the most similar to Vietnam. You are the most similar to Vietnam. 야포의 CEO 후안 엘리에스 예, 사장님께서 온라인 세일즈인 칠레를 주제로 발표하시겠습니다. First of all, thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's, uh, we, really, uh, we really feel really proud to be here, uh, to represent and to talk about online sales in Chile. Uh, my name is Juan. I am, I am the CEO of a, of a Chilean company. Uh, what we do is uh, online classified sales. Uh, it's, a, it's a specific part of the e-commerce. Uh, it's more a uh, focus on C2C uh, market and also a, a small part of B2C as well. Mm -hmm. My idea is to, to try to focus uh, on online as a general at the beginning, to talk a little, about, a little bit about our situation, and then uh, deep dive on, on online in, in, the, in, the, in the part of the classified, which is what we really know. And to end, uh, telling a little bit of what we do, uh, since we started and, uh, and, and so far and what are the challenges ahead, okay? So here, here is where we stand today. Uh, Chile is an 18 uh, million country. We have an internet penetration of 71.7%. Per, uh, uh, is according to the Latin American standards, pretty e equal situation and we are the biggest in this case uh, in, the, in the continent. Mm -hmm. In terms of the e-commerce index, we are uh, number one in Latin America, uh, uh, is 17th in the, in the world. Uh, in this case, 
it's difficult to say uh, a, a number in transactions. So, so what we have done is to try to check what is going on between our our users, between buyers and sellers, how, how much money they 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 uh, use to buy and sell. And I thought we have a total of 2.9 uh, billion in 2016. And we are waiting. We are expecting to have uh, more or less 3.3 uh, or 3.5 in this year. Mm -hmm. In case of uh, this, is the industry, the, the classified industry is, a classi uh, is an industry of, of volumes. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, we we have managed to build in these uh, six well six years a, a really really good brand that has grown a lot. And uh, now it's like number twelve in the in the in the, in the rankings of of the of volume of, of visiting internet. And if you go like uh, specifically on the local uh, brands, uh, local uh, uh, sites. We are number two behind the uh, Banco Estado, which is the state bank, the, the bank of the state. Mm -hmm. This is <clears throat> the situation in the in the economy today. We have a GDP of uh, 1.6% 1, 1. and a, an unemployment rate of 6.5%. It's a pretty, pretty stable in the last uh, three years, a little bit of growth. And in case of the socioeconomic situation, uh, as I said, it's an 18 uh, million uh, population uh, country, and we are growing at a rate of one, one percent uh, more or less. Mm -hmm. so, uh, our our business is is focused in four main categories or, or four group of categories. One is cars. The second one is real estate. Uh, third one is um, jobs, and the last one is consumer goods. Mm -hmm. So in this in this uh, graph, I will try to show you how is the situation in relationship with cars and real estate. So that's why we have these uh, figures that 62% own a own a home, 13% own an additional home, and 50% owns a vehicle. Mm -hmm. In terms of income, the distribution is is like this: 50% uh, uh, is a, is a huge group. It's half of the population is under the 1.2 thousand dollars of income, and then we have this. Two different groups. In terms of debt, the, ma the, the majority of the debt are in, in, in the consumer sector, uh, behind the, 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 the mortgage and also cars. Mm -hmm. If we go to the uh, to the online part, uh, penetration as well as all Latin American is is heavy in terms of mobile. Uh, the smartphone usage is 94 percent out of out of six that which is in in, in desktop. Uh, is massive and, and is really well aligned with our situation today that we, I will talk to you like further. Mm -hmm. So let me talk a bit, a bit of, of Jabo on, on our business. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we are part of a Norwegian uh, company that, does, that has been doing this kind of job since the 90s. It's present in, in 30 countries with a total of 200 uh, million users in the world. Mm -hmm. In case of Latin America, we are present in five different countries. Uh, uh, in Mexico, we have a brand called Segunda Mano, which is pretty similar to what we do in Chile. Colombia, we have a vertical that is specialized in, in real estate and also a classified side. In Brazil, we have Info Jobs, which is a vertical specifically for jobs, uh, and OLX, which is similar to us, it's a, it's, a, it's a classified side. And we have just launched in Dominican Republic uh, a, a, a site that is also for classified. And in Chile, the, the, the brand that uh, I lead uh, is, is Japo. Mm -hmm. In case of Jabo, I think to explain you a little bit better what we do, uh, I, I bring like two videos. Uh, the first is is the TV ad that we ran when we started, like in 2012, 2013, and uh, it's in Spanish. But I think when when you see when uh, seeing it, you will realize what uh, what we do. Okay. <laughs> Si no lo usa, Yabo, véndelo. En yabo.cl es muy fácil. Publica tu aviso gratis, ponte de acuerdo con el comprador y haz un buen negocio. ¿Qué estás esperando? Pruébalo. Yabo.cl. So this one, one was one of the first TV TV ads that we ran. And, and the next one is the is the the, the ultimate that we launched in, in March. Uh, the the aim of this campaign was to talk about the eternal promise, the thing that we always buy, and know in the, saying that we will use every day, but at the end is is uh, kept in the in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. 
Esta, mira, con esta siempre tendría el pasto cortito. La eterna promesa. Todo eso que no usas, véndelo en yapo.cl. Sacas una foto, publicas, vendes. Descarga gratis la aplicación y empieza a vender ahora mismo. Yapo.cl So, that's the idea. It's pretty, pretty simple. We have two kind of users, the buyers and sellers. In case of the buyers, you go to the site, specifically nowadays in, the, in the, our apps, browse for a product in the, between uh, all of our 12 categories. Uh, you, you find the product that you want, you contact the seller, then you coordinate the meeting, that which is offline. It, they, normally, the people do it in, in the metro station or bus stops, and they close the deal. In case of the seller, uh, it's, 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 the, it's the other way around. They, you select your product, you take your picture, you post your ad easily, you wait for replies, and then you have a good deal. Mm -hmm. The important stuff in our case, we divided the, the, the users in two different kind of users. Mm -hmm. The private user, which is the high volume that we have today, is the user that, uh, like me or, or you, that wanted to, to sell a, a couch, a TV, a car, a real estate, and you go to the site, it's a, it's a free service that where you can post your ad and wait for replies to sell that. They, normally, these kind of users uh, go through the, through the mobile site, and, and, and the other part is the professional, where the, uh, where, which in that sense uh, is a different kind of user. It's a user that manages a huge amount of, of ads uh, and, and they request a, a, a value-added services. In that sense, the, this kind of user browse this site through desktop, mainly. They are concentrated in the cars, jobs, and real estate uh, categories, um, and also invest in the site to have this value these value-added services that we are, I will talk about in the in the business model part. This is uh, well. This is the, our numbers. Uh, as I said, it's a super massive uh, site in, in, in Chile. Uh, so the the um, our database and, and our uh, the behaviors in the user in our site is pretty like uh, in line with the with the behavior of the Chilean internet users. Mm -hmm. We have a total of 8.5 uh, monthly active users. Uh, which from those, 60% uh, are male. In case of age, 71% are millennials. But one of the curious thing and important thing is that from the age of 35 to 44 are the ones to buy stuff mm -hmm, and to buy like premium products. In case of platform, uh, nowadays we have 80, between 70 and 80% of our traffic is, is mobile. And from those, 80% came from uh, Android uh, operating systems. And the category important, like uh, curious also stuff, is, is we have realized that the categories uh, is super related with the gender. In case of cars, we know that it's highly probably that the, the seller will be a man, and in case of clothes, it's a woman. Uh, this is uh, also something curious that has happened in this, this uh, six, well, seven, seven years. Uh, when we started, our traffic was 100% desktop, and this has changed rapidly. And now we are considering like 77%, and we have all days that in the weekends that we have 90% of the traffic of mobile devices. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, the history that try to sum up. We when we started like in 2011, we were only four, uh, and with the aim to build a brand that the all Chileans like recognize and think about it when they wanted to sell something over the internet. Mm -hmm. And our first milestone in the in the in the in 2007 was to reach two million users. Uh, then we started to grow and we started to realize that the, this effect was was true. Uh, and and we have seen that between buyers and sellers we have we have seen that at the beginning they were trading 178 million dollars. In 2013, we reached the million active ads. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of uh, visit, the aim was to reach this 40 million. And in 2015, we already had 30 million. And in terms of active users, we, uh, we are now at 8.5 million users. And, and just uh, for the end, uh, this is the big question that everyone asks, because when, when you see the software, is is free to buy and sell, and no one understands how we make money. Mm -hmm. uh, since it's a high, uh, and it's something that we have started to develop like two years ago, 
uh, since, since it's a massive uh, site, we started doing advertising, uh, both le with ad networks and also uh, with um, uh, with targeted advertising. And then, and now we are developing the, the new line, which is classified, uh, and it's mainly focused to pro users. Uh, pro users can have like since they have like a massive amount of ads. We have solutions like bulk import, the statistic uh, data, and uh, and uh, insertion fees and. Uh, customer support and so on and so forth. I think, uh, yeah, that's it. Hope I can, I can explain a little bit with what we do and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 이런 주제로 발표해 주시겠습니다. 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 아, uh, good day everyone and uh, thank you for having the Digital Commerce Association of the Philippines being part of this uh, FIALAC uh, Business Forum. Uh, today I'll be sharing to you the, the the challenges and opportunities and practically the the e-commerce landscape in the Philippines so you'll be informed but uh, uh, first, I'd like to introduce our association, Digital Commerce Association of the Philippines is the largest network of digital commerce professionals, thought leaders, innovators coming from uh, online marketplaces, payments, fintech, logistics, among others in the Philippines as we make uh, Filipino merchants globally competitive in digital commerce. Uh, we, represent, uh, we represent the Philippine uh, digital commerce industry and make it a norm uh, with the international standards as we continue to promote and advocate digital commerce in the country. Philippines, uh, without even knowing it, even as uh, in the late 90s, has been uh, immersed with e-commerce. So from, from dealing with uh, uh, C2C, B2C, B2C, uh, B2B to B2C, up to direct retailing of brand.com, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting ecosystem to actually uh, look into. And to, to show you a little further of the snapshots of the Philippines economy in terms of e-commerce, uh, these are the top uh, five activities that Filipinos do whenever they go online. So predominantly, uh, we are very socially uh, connected as we are very embraced, uh, uh, embraced uh, Facebook that much along with the other social networking sites, but uh, comes really close second is online shopping. Uh, that's considering coming from a, one, a little over 100 million Filipinos. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, besides also uh, 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 socially connected, the median age for a Filipino is 24 years old, with having 58% uh, uh, internet penetration and 38% coming from mobile. And considering that the 117 uh, mobile penetration, meaning there are more sm uh, there are more mobile phones in the Philippines than there is Filip there are Filipinos. And uh, as a result, this gives us a 27% uh, growth in internet users. So, uh, as compared to the global average of 4.7 hours uh, spending t their time on the internet, uh, Filipinos spend most of the time uh, among any other, uh, any, anybody else in the world. So we spend over 5 hours and 23 minutes, uh, possibly because our internet is one of the slowest, <laughs> not only the most expensive, but um, 30, uh, 3 hours and 30 would be spent on mobile, and the opportunity uh, would be also in terms of mobile, 96% of our market is on prepaid, while for, uh, only 4% has gone to postpaid. And uh, in terms of uh, spent on social media, again, uh, that's where most of our time has been spent. Now, when you look at the, when you, when you start talk, to talk about e-commerce and uh, mobile commerce in the Philippines, these are just some of the things uh, I, we want you to remember that um, we, we have about 38% e-commerce penetration. 26% uh, of them are coming from mobile. But some of the things you also want to, to look into is also the 85% e-commerce growth, uh, in, uh, e growth and uh, uh, average spend of uh, 33 US dollars revenue per user. Uh, in terms of the things that uh, Filipinos buy online, 49% is into fashion and accessories. 9.5% 9, 9. is into electronics, 
7.6 is into uh, home and living, while 6% is to food, while the 0 0.05 is into online services. Uh, using our internal, uh, internal data, uh, the demographics in the Philippines in terms of uh, consumption, uh, again, coming from uh, majority of the market that you'll be meeting with in the Philippines is uh, about in the ages of 18 to 34, while uh, 35 to 44 uh, would be a smaller group than the 45 and up would be at, at 5%. Now, in terms of gender, uh, predominantly the... The, the female is the primary market in terms of purchasing. This is probably because the male would ask uh, the, the pur uh, to purchase on their behalf. Now, in terms of payment, as uh, similar to our uh, uh, fellow delegates, these are actually one of the growing opportunities that we have in the Philippines. And in fact, if you look at the, the payments or the fintech uh, uh, space of, of the Philippines, this is where we have, more, we have most startups with because uh, they've been trying to figure out uh, how to improve the payment penetration in the Philippines because uh, uh, you know, in, when, you, when you talk about e-commerce, 60% is still on COD, 30% is alternative payment, uh, payments. This is the likes of uh, over-the-counter payments via uh, bank deposits or... Uh, uh, and also, be, uh, it also paved the way for for some some businesses in the Philippines, like pawn shop, to become remittance centers, in uh, transmitting payments from from one person to another. And would come last would be the credit card and PayPal penetration, which already at uh, ten percent. In terms of la uh, delivery and last mile fulfillment, um, before in in back when when we established the association in 20, uh, 2011, the, the majority of the uh, uh, digital consumers were only compromise, uh, composed of uh, Metro Manila, having 80-20 division among the, the uh, uh, other provinces in the Philippines. But come 2016, it's now almost half. So half of, half, half of the market would be from, from Metro Manila, while half would be coming from nearby uh, provinces in the, in, in the Philippines. So uh, this is the current situation in, in, uh, in the Philippines. So we have, uh, we have a very low credit card penetration, PayPal penetration. We have a very, uh, we have about 20, 25 uh, bank penetration. And um, if, although uh, in the Philippines, we have 7,641 islands. That's, uh, that's something to look forward to if you're a tourist, but if you're a business coming in, it's a supply chain and logistics nightmare. <laughs> And uh, some of the perceived challenges are security, connectivity, literacy, and trust, which is basically similar to the other presenters. However, when we conducted a survey uh, back in 20, uh, 2015, when we asked, why don't you shop online, Filipinos has responded as the top concerns would be security, would come second payment options, because of, again, as earlier mentioned, some of them would, ha would, would, would like to handle and view the product by themselves, and then speed, because, again, it would take a while for, for uh, things to be delivered. However, when we tried to change the question into why didn't, he, why didn't you do your last non-necessity purchase online, the, the, the ranking has changed. So meaning it's not necessarily issues of security, but Filipinos were just saying that we don't, they don't have much um, selection or choice to, to, to begin with. And then the only come second would be payment convenience. And in terms of pricing, they're not really much concerned with the price. Probably that's uh, the, the, one, the, the $33, because uh, the $33 uh, data earlier, because that's the only uh, amount of money that available to be purchased. And then would come, and again, surprisingly, security will be the least of the concerns. Now, uh, as a result, this gives the Philippine government to actually act, uh, act upon uh, these kind of things. So in the Philippines, we launched last year the, the Philippine e-commerce roadmap, we're in it, 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 uh, the, the target is to work with the government in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in resolving many other uh, pain points uh, of, uh, uh, or rather blockage in the e-commerce growth in the Philippines. So uh, this is actually the, the, the kind of things that deals about innovation, intellectual capital, uh, infrastructure, and uh, integration. So. In terms of challenges, these are the kind of things we still have yet to overcome. We have, again, uh, I guess uh, one of the slowest and expensive internet access and only having two major telcos operate in the country. 
Uh, so that gives a very least competition in terms of the telecommunications industry. Uh, again, we also have a very minimal take up on e-payment service. We, we have issues with uh, security and privacy, but again, uh, in, in terms of the payment service, this is the, where the growth of in, uh, fintech in the country is coming in. Uh, another would be uh, the, the association alongside with the government has been working with the likes of Trust Seals, Digital Certificate, uh, and ICT initiatives. And um, uh, again, the, one of the challenges would be uh, ge uh, the fragmented uh, geographical um, uh, uh, geography, rather. So. In terms of opportunities, again, uh, the, 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 Philippine, the, the Philippine economy is uh, relatively, uh, in terms of the market, it, you have, we have a very young population. Uh, we are socially connected. We have uh, mobile as the e-commerce driver, which is basically, uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, the, the, this particular potential, uh, the, the mobile, uh, the ones is giving, uh, the, tends to take off the, the B2C market. And uh, in terms of uh, 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 cross-border, the, the government just recently uh, upgraded the, the mini-V value from, from 10 pe uh, Philippine pesos to 10,000 pesos. So meaning if you're, if you're a businessman you would like to penetrate the Philippine market, um, you know, with the average spending of 1,500 uh, Philippine peso, you know, that's, that's practically... Uh, um, uh, the, the customers in the Philippines would only have to pay about 100 pesos postal fee coming from any part of the country if they're purchasing anything below 10,000 pesos. So this gives us about uh, a robust consumption growth. So uh, in 2016, we, ha we have seen about 6.1% growth uh, in terms of consumption. And this is probably because of the rise of the middle class who's having uh, 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 a monthly average uh, or an income of 30,000 pesos up to 70,000 pesos. So, as I close, um, it's, it's always more fun in the Philippines as our, our tourism uh, calls it, but with your help and with your further collaboration, information technology, IT, and Internet of Things could be more fun in the Philippines. Thank you so much for your attention. Good day. Thank you. Hola. I'm Gonzalo Vegaso, I'm from Peru. Um, I went back to my country only four years ago after uh, almost 14 years living in Silicon Valley where I worked for several startups, Microsoft and Google. And my last job was with, uh, over there was with Google where I was a finance global director. And um, the main reason why I went back to Peru was because I saw a lot of opportunities in Latin America, especially uh, with internet. And, um, and we are going to... Share, I'm going to share with you one of these opportunities. My role in Peru, uh, I'm basically a venture builder. In the last four to five years, we developed uh, five different businesses. Uh, but this one is the one that I really like and I'm, I decided to manage. You know, normally a venture builder will analyze a problem, will put together a solution, uh, a team, you know, will try to get a, a good entrepreneur to to lead the team, uh, we'll raise money, uh, but in this case, when we found a, a, a logistics opportunity in Latin America, I really liked the problem, and I really liked the solution that we were putting together, and now uh, I am 100% involved with this, with this uh, last bet, technology bet that we have in Latin America. So let me uh, just tell you a little bit about what we have seen. So after my time in Silicon Valley, I started analyzing what happened with e-commerce in, in Latin America. And we have seen, you know, amazing growth, but compared to what was happening in the US, in Europe, and even here in Asia, it was not that big, you know? And we check also the parcel volume, and it was, in the US, it was gigantic. And I remember, you know, this is a picture of my porch in the, in the building where I live, a lot of boxes. 
but we don't have this in Latin America. So we start thinking, what's going on? Why, why, why are we not having these type of situations in Latin America? And we uh, ended up analyzing, you know, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Argentina. Didn't go to Mexico, but we found a lot of different situations. Uh, main thing that we got that, w that was not helping uh, e-commerce to grow was credit card penetration. A lot of our colleagues here already discussed that. But we said, should we solve that? No, that's a very difficult problem. There are a lot of people trying to solve it. Let's analyze other problems that we might have in e-commerce. And we ended up checking the logistics, the platforms, you know, how you ship and send the goods that you are buying or that you're, the goods that you are selling. And we uh, realized that that was a big problem. And we realized there were problems all over the process from the service problems, the type of service and the range of uh, the logistic service. Uh, the speed also was a problem. The cost was a huge problem. And there was zero innovation in Latin America in terms of logistics for e-commerce. So we said, this is a great, great problem. Let's, let's try to work on them. And we ended up analyzing a key factor, which is customer experience. And we realized that there are a lot of people investing a lot of money on building the best e-commerce sites in our region. Amazing experience. You click beautiful pictures, but when you press checkout, the nightmare starts, you know? And basically, all that you are trying to build as an entrepreneur with your e-commerce site is degenerating in the experience when you have to deal with the logistics. So basically, we understand and we put this, you know, I actually got this in a frame in my office where we said that unfortunately the delivery experience in Latin America is below the global standard and that's what we're trying to solve. So, a couple of elements. The first thing is that in Latin America when you buy something, you have to wait on average five days to actually get it. So, obviously when you buy something you are really happy, next day you are a little bit anxious but you say, oh, it's only two days, you know. Then you go to the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, everything is really bad in the fifth day. You are almost crazy calling customer support saying, where are my shoes? I bought a shoes, you know, a pair of shoes, where are they? And it's just really bad experience. You, and obviously, the e-commerce sites wanted to generate the best of the experience for their customers. Another element, and some of my colleagues here touched on this, is that in Latin America for the C2C exchange, you know, when you buy some stuff, for example, in Yapo or in Mercado Libre or in OLX, you buy something from a seller and then you coordinate where this person will give you what you are buying and they're saying, let's go to the metro station. Okay, I need to find the guy with the blue t-shirt here. You know, it's absolutely impossible to do it. So these are the things that we're seeing in Latin America and then I know that you also got some of these problems in, in, in this region. Another problem that we are having is what is the address for these guys? This is typical Latin America, you know. As you can see in this picture, this is Lima. It's a, it's a little mountain. They don't have roads. They don't have avenues. It's basically paths. So when one of these guys will tell you the address, it will be a lot number 47 in the San Pedro Mountain. So, and we have to go there and deliver something, you know? So it's a really difficult problem, the addresses in Latin America. Another problem that we have is that we got elections every four years or five years, and a new mayor will come into the city and will change all the names of the addresses, putting the names of the political parties, heroes that uh, they got. So it's, it's, it's not easy to deal with addresses in, in, in Latin America. And cash and delivery is another problem. Nobody, you know, trust is an issue. Uh, we have seen 50%, 60% of the trade is based on cash and delivery. But don't think about only the, the, that somebody is going to pay with cash. It's the operational problem of managing 
that cash, as soon as somebody is having it in their hands and the trade is, com is complete, you have to control it, you have to deposit it, you have to reconcile it. It's, there's a lot of operational problems around. And obviously, you are carrying cash, and somebody can also rob you in Latin America because, unfortunately, we got a lot of security issues. So it's a huge, huge problem. Well, when you got problems, you got opportunities. You know, and we said, wow, this is great. And that's precisely why I decided to, to co-found this, this company. And what we have created is Chasky. Chasky in the Inca's culture was the guy that actually ran shipping things for the Inca. So what we're trying to do is to be the leading platform for delivery of packages in Latin America, specialized on e-commerce and retail. We're on a mission, and our mission is simple in the statement, but very difficult on the back. Uh, we basically deliver the shipments of the best operators of e-commerce and retail in Latin America to the homes or offices of their customers. And this is our business model. You know, we partner with the best e-commerce and retail uh, uh, companies in Peru and Argentina where we operate. We develop technology, you know, basically a 100% proprietary technology platform where we got algorithms to generate the fastest and more efficient uh, routes in the cities, uh, apps to manage our fleet and the drivers, apps to manage you know, the business in general, and provide information to the customers so they will know what's going on on a daily basis with their packages. We operate a fast shipping vehicle fleet under the Uber concept, so basically we invite people to come and uh, affiliate to, to our system. They come with their vehicle and their phone. And we check backgrounds of all these guys just to generate trust and be able to, to work with the best people. We provide same-day delivery services. We provide scale delivery services. So basically, you can tell me, hey, go to my home and be there at 3.15, and we will be there to deliver you something. And we also do express delivery in less than two hours in four cities right now, in Lima, in Arequipa, in Trujillo, all of those three cities in Peru, and now in, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. We collect a fee for every box that we ship. We obviously do cash on delivery with next day deposit because it's the money of our clients, so we have to deliver deposit next day. And what we provide is on-demand services, last mile, we vary the cost of the delivery, which is definitely uh, impacting the traditional logistics model where it's not on demand. In essence, what we offer our customers is peace of mind. All of us will know where the package is. We got technology so we can show you in the map how it is moving, going to your home. And it's very important to show who the driver is in Latin America because you will open your home door to this person. We got a lot of security issues. We need to know who's the guy that will actually knock our door so we can open and get our boxes. We provide the cell phone of this person. This person is trained to get the best user experience that, you can, that he can give to the customer using keywords like, sir, thank you, good morning, things like that. And, and basically, we are providing this view to the customers of our customers so the anxiety of buying online and not knowing where your package is got solved completely. We also uh, launch uh, uh, apps, and anybody can now order a shipment from Chasky. For example, people, this is mainly for B2C, so if you forgot your wallet and you are at the office, you know, you don't want to go and there's a lot of traffic, you don't want to take your car, just get a service from, from Chasky and, you know, a Chasky one person will go grab your wallet and leave it, give it to you in your office. And, and, and that's a very convenient service that we're doing in, 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 in no time. <clears throat> Remember this picture? So we solved this with machine learning. And in fact, uh, Accenture include us in, a, in an analysis that they have done with machine learning in Latin America that was presented at the World Economic Forum of LATAM in Buenos Aires a couple of months ago. So what we, what we do is when we have the lot 47, which is one of these blue houses, the delivery guy will go there and when he, when he or she delivers the actual box, 
Uh, we put in, the, in our app, okay, it was delivered. So immediately our technology will learn that the transaction was complete. So the address, which is you know, X and Y coordinates, exists. So may, maybe in the next two days, somebody will go not to lot 47, but to lot 43. And then we start getting more deliveries to that area. There's a point where the machine will tell us, okay, if somebody's going to lot 27 in Cerro San Pedro, in this case, San Pedro Mountain, um, the machine will tell us, oh, I know where it is, don't worry. And we will put it automatically in a map, okay? So those are the things that we are, we are trying to solve to, to get better results for our customers. And there are a lot of customers here because if you have seen we got a very high penetration of, of uh, cell phones. So the first experience of a lot of the Peruvians are not with computers or even laptops or iPads. It's through cell phones. And these guys are the ones that are buying online because they are getting better prices online than going to the actual shops. And they are also asking us to deliver in one day because they want to have the same type of level of service like like uh, uh, somebody wealthy in, in, in our countries. So just to give you an, uh, a sense, uh, we started our operations in June 2015. Now we got more than 220 uh, corporate clients. As I said, we operate in four cities where we are launching Cordoba, Mar del Plata in Argentina. Uh, we are also launching Mexico in September. Uh, we deliver more than 350,000 packages uh, more than almost 40,000 routes and travel more than s almost 700,000 kilometers without having any motorcycles or, or cars. And uh, yesterday was uh, our vice president, uh, Mrs. Arauz was, Ms. Arauz was here and I was very happy to, I'm very happy to share with you that uh, through Startup Peru, we won uh, a grant and we received $150,000. That's the type of uh, of uh, encouragement that we are receiving from our government to keep moving. I mean, it's not easy. You have to apply. We have to apply and, 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 and basically uh, compete with 26 other startups in Peru that generated more than a half a million in revenue. And uh, only three got this award. So very happy to share that with you and, uh, and to thank the Peruvian government uh, officials that are here for uh, this support. And thank you very much. Uh, happy to, sh to talk to you later. If you want to know more about e-commerce, uh, we have knowledge about Peru, Argentina, Mexico, and some other countries. And uh, I'm really looking, to, looking forward to talk to you, especially because uh, it's in our plan in 2018 to, to enter one of the Asian markets. I got some experience doing that because uh, I helped some of my friends, uh, the Añanos family, Peruvian family, that uh, is the owner of Big Cola, um, to enter some of the Asian markets. And I love Asia. And I, I think that we are very similar in our problems, very similar in the solutions that we are trying to, to build. And uh, at the end, it's, 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 gonna, it's, it's not easy to actually inter internationalize a Latin American company in, 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 in Asia. But uh, we're going to try it next year. Thank you very much. Peru의 곤잘로 베가소 그 사스키 그 공동 창업자 겸 사장님 말씀으로 오늘 그 연선이 발생이 다 끝났습니다. 저희 이제 질문 시간인데 시간이 15분 정도 남았는데 그 플로어에서 혹시 질문 뭐한 한두 개 정도 있으시면은 받고 예. 어, 어, 질문이 생각보다 많은데요. 제, 제, 저기, 딱 가장 먼저 손든 분이 제 앞에, 예, 안경 쓰신 분, 예. 자기 소속하고 밝혀주시고, 그 다음에 질문해 주십시오. 네. 아, 네, 안녕하세요. 어, 발표 너무 잘 들었고요. 저는 박세빈이라고 하고요. 그, 그, 스페, 스페인어 기반의 한국어 교육 컨텐츠를 개발하는 스타트업을 지금 하고 있습니다. 그 한류 팬이 한 천만 명 정도 되는 걸로 지금 알고 있기 때문에 비전이 있다고 보, 보고 있는데요. 우선 궁금한 거는 어, 그 공통 질문일 수 있을 것 같은데요. 어, 물론 지금 핀테크가 지금 뭐 발전하는 것도 이제 좀 이해되고 있고 굉장히 오늘 정보를 많이 들었는데 
당장 올해나 내년 초에 진출하고 싶은 어, 스타트업들이 있을 거라고 생각이 됩니다. 어, 그럴 경우에 그런 기업들이 가장 현실적으로 먼저 어, 생각해 볼수 있는 결제 수단 같은 게좀 현지 이렇게 기업 하시는 분들로부터 좀 듣고 싶고요. 두 번째로 지금 중남미가 전체적 국가 어, 법인세들이 좀 글로벌 스탠다보다 조금 높은 걸로 지금 알고 있습니다. 뭐 멕시코 같은 경우에 한 30% 정도 되는 걸로 알고 있는데요. 어 사실 초반에 어 수익성이 기대되지 않는 경우에 진출했을 때 쉽지 않거든요. 그래서 어 이렇게 초기 스타트업 또는 이제 해외로 진출하는 스타트업들을 위한 제도가 있는지 좀 그런 것들이 궁금합니다. 어, 답을 간단하게 듣고 답을 넘어갔습니다. 저기 일단 이거는 무역 카페에서 잠깐 말씀해 주실 수 있을 것 같고요. 그 국가마다 약간 제도는 다를 것 같은데 혹시 그 외국에서 스타트업 그 외국 스타트업 기업이 그 현지 국가 진출할 때 어떤 특이한 제도나 인센티브 있으면 그 나머지 참가 분께서 설명해 주시면 되겠습니다. 먼저 그 무역 카페 조분 부장님 잠깐 말씀합니다. 네 어, 질문. 감사합니다. 그 스타트업에 대한 부분은 어, 별도로 이렇게 좀 어, 상담을 해야 될것 같다는 생각이 들고요. 지금 질문이 그 중남미 지역의 결제 시스템에 대한 질문을 해주셨습니다. 그래서 그건 아마 그 부분은 어, 다른 패널들이 이렇게 답을 하시는 게더 적절할 것 같다는 생각이 들고요. 다만 저희가 이제 케이몰 24를 운영하면서 그 결제 시스템 부분도 관련이 되기 때문에 그 부분에 대해서 지금 그 스타트업이 시작하니까 그 부분에 대해서 저희 경험을 공유했으면 합니다. 그 온라인 그 B2C 몰의 가장 그 챌린지가 어, 두, 가, 두 가지입니다. 어, 기본적으로 이제 딜리버리 시스템이요, 로지스틱스하고 그 다음에 이제 페이 시스템인데. 어, 정말 어렵습니다. 그 저희가 지금 뭐 중국, 미국 이런 데는 다 하고 있지만 어, 새로 이제 영국 시장을 진출하려고 아마존, 음, 잉글랜드하고 이렇게 이제 어, 제휴를 추진하고 있고 또 일본의 아마존 접해라고는 하고 있지만 일본의 대표적인 그 온라인 쇼핑몰인 라쿠텐이랑 하려고 이렇게 이제 계속 3, 4 개월 동안. 협의를 해오고 있는 중입니다. 그런데 그두개다 굉장히 그 금융 시스템이 잘 발달된 선진국인데도 불구하고 온라인 쇼핑에 대한 그 결제 시스템이 그렇게 쉽지 않습니다. 아직도 해결이 안 돼서 어 계속 <웃음> 진행 중에 있습니다. 그런 거에 비추어 볼때 중남미 아마 다른 패널들이 답변을 해주시겠지만 어떨지 모르겠다는 생각이 듭니다. 이상 도움이 됐으면 고맙겠습니다. 예, 혹시. Yes, re regarding payments, what I would tell you is, if it's mobile, it will be great. But basically, the majority of people, at least in Mexico, that are coming into the digital economy are doing it through mobile platforms. So I think the future of electronic payments is it's mobile. Regarding corporate tax, I wouldn't worry that much about it. To be honest, I'm an investor in startups and that they don't have profit. So that's a problem you will have later on. And my only advice is that from the beginning, you should look very carefully at unit economics. Basically, you do want to have a profitable business in the operating margin. If you do that, believe me, you're going to be okay. Yeah, 감사합니다. 그리고 혹시 개별적으로 또 질문이 있을지 모르겠는데 저희가 이 세션 끝나고 바로 오찬하니까 그때 시간을 내서 자유롭게. 그 개별적으로 질문해 주시면 좋겠고 마지막으로 우리 그 저기 그로바스 씨 다음부터 우리 왕 사장님부터 해가지고 마지막으로 한 말씀씩 듣고 그 종료하도록 하겠습니다. 예, 왕왕 왕 회장님 먼저 말씀해 주시죠. 땡큐. Well, uh... We are looking forward to the cross-border e-commerce will be a great bridge to link the uh, people in the region and further the, uh, the development of our economy and better serve our customers. Thank you.
네, 본모 본모 회장님. About this question, I really, I think, I think what has already been said is probably I, I don't have much to to add, uh, especially in the case of Venezuela. You know, the, the question is mainly for for uh, uh, South Americans. So, uh, if you would like to uh, to invest to or uh, focus on the Vietnamese market, uh, let me know so, uh, so we can uh, talk about it later. Thank you. In the in the case of uh, of Chile, uh, payment also is is growing a lot. In case of mobile, it's not like uh, the majority right now, but it's growing. Uh, in terms of provider, there is uh, the biggest one, which is called Transbank. Uh, they have a, like a solution that's called WebPay. It's not uh, really, really well advanced. Uh, have some, some issues, but it's the only one and the, all the companies is using. And the big, biggest problem is the, is the, the as, as all of my colleagues said, is, is the, the credit card penetration, which is super, super low. So you cannot play a bit with that to retain money then, then, then to work with that, so uh, ma ma the major payments are with debit cards. Mm -hmm. Okay, for, for the concern on, on the payments, and uh, first for, for the concern of the payments, um, if you want to come to the Philippines, I wouldn't be more concerned with the payments uh, if, if that's one of your pain points coming in, because uh, there are like, you know, countless of fintechs have already uh, came in to, to the Philippines, and. What, what we need to be more concerned about, uh, about uh, would be Filipinos, uh, especially our government has yet to embrace uh, you know, uh, e-governance and e-payments uh, towards uh, the government services. For example, getting business permits, um, filing for certain, uh, getting your passports and visas. These are still all cash basis. And until the government, our government has embraced uh, alternative payments like electronic payments, mobile payments, then by nature, the Filipinos would be you know, more than capable in paying online and there'll be more uh, access for electronic payments. Now, as uh, on the second question, uh, on, on, in terms of final thoughts, um, you know, if you're a business and would like to penetrate the Philippine, uh, the Philippine market, do not be afraid because Filipinos are actually willing to, to shop or buy something, uh, but they are limited with options. So, you know, if, if given a chance, uh, Filipinos are more than willing to, to buy products, whether physical or virtual, we are more than willing to actually consume. We just want to have uh, you know, first-hand experience of such and you know, see that it is available for us to access, whether locally, if you set up a business in the Philippines or cross-border, uh, considering that we already increased the, the mini V value uh, in, in, in terms of customs. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give you some ideas in terms of the, your question about taxes. Um, I completely agree with Eric that you should not think about it when you're building your startup. I'm also an angel investor, and uh, it's, it's, it's not that important at the, at the early stage. but. It is important to know that uh, in Latin America, there are uh, a lot of governments that are working t towards the promotion of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, Argentina, for example, a couple of months ago, um, approved a new law that is called the, the entrepreneurship law. And basically, it's reducing the amount of uh, taxes that you have to pay, and also giving a lot of uh, um, access to uh, loans and credit from Coming, coming from the from the government. In the case of Peru, we also get grants like the one I mentioned, and uh, we got special um, uh, consideration and funds when you are trying to generate new technology that uh, was not generated in the country before. So you can get uh, money for free from from the country. Um, uh, I know that uh, in, in the case of Brazil, also they got some. Uh, tax-free incentives when you create startups, not in the cities, uh, in the main cities, you know, in Rio or Sao Paulo, in other cities, you also got some tax incentives. So it's, it's just a matter of trying to find uh, the, the right incentives, but it's more important to get the right strategy, actually, to, to build the, the startup quickly. That's it. Thank you. 예, 감사합니다. 질문이 많은 것 같은데 바로 이어지는 네트워킹 오차 때 하시고요. 이걸로 세션을 마치겠는데 한 가지 말씀만 드리겠습니다. 우리 4차 산업혁명 하면은 그 
항상 기업을 떠올릴 수밖에 없습니다. 기업이 그 혁신의 주체이기 때문에 그런데 그 4차 산업혁명을 따라다니는 말이 있는데 창조적 파괴라고 그러니까 기업가의 모습은 일자리를 새로 만들고 사회를 편하게 만드는 창조자의 모습도 있고 고전적인 일자리를 파괴하는 파괴자의 목, 어, 얼굴도 있습니다. 근데 여기 보시는 분들 얼굴 보시면 아시겠지만 파괴자의 얼굴은 없습니다. 다들 창조자의 좋은 마음을 갖고 있는 분들입니다. 그 오, 오찬 시간에 이분들하고 좋은 네트워크 하시고 그 다음에 좋은 비즈니스 기회 가지시면 좋겠습니다. 오늘 참가해 주신 여러분 감사드립니다. 이곳으로 그 3차가 피엘락 비즈니스 포럼 마치도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다.